Before we begin, I want to remind you about Chilling, the scary stories app that I'm a narrator on, which will very soon become Chilling 2.0, a full-fledged platform which will include video content in addition to all the stories. Full-length horror films, series, and exclusive Chilling originals are just some of what Chilling 2.0 is bringing to horror fans. It's being crafted by horror fans for horror fans. So download now and start your free trial to see if you like it. There's so many popular narrators on Chilling and over a thousand stories with hours more being added every week. Lastly, Chilling is now accepting investments from the public and investors are starting to take notice. You can get in on it now before the share is projected to increase in value greatly, so don't miss out. Chilling is a must-have app for horror story lovers and Chilling 2.0 will change the game completely. The links to download and check out the investment page are all down in the description below. It was a really average day, I'll just say that. Most days were always very average for me. I'm a woman in my early 30s living in San Francisco. Not married, no kids, I don't think that really matters, but as a woman I figured people would ask. I worked for a law firm, but I was just an assistant to one of the partners. It surprisingly paid really well. It's the only reason I could afford to live in the city. I want to start off by saying I love where I live. San Francisco is a gorgeous city and I've never once taken it for granted. If anything, I defended it a little too much. I'd walk the more dangerous streets or neighborhoods just to prove to my friends that they weren't really all that bad, or eat at sketchy restaurants for the same reason. I guess you could say that I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Well, on one of the very few rainy days of the year, I decided to go on a walk with my friend along the city streets that I love so much. It was sunny when we left, so wearing flip-flops seemed like an okay idea. Wrong. Only 45 minutes into our walk, and it started to rain. My friend and I thought that maybe it would be best to get back to my apartment as quickly as possible, so we decided to jog back. We were moving at a steady pace when one of my flip-flops fell off, and I felt a sharp pain in the bottom of my foot just between my toes. I almost face-planted when the pain hit, but luckily I was able to catch myself on a nearby telephone pole. I grabbed my foot and raised it to about waist level and was sad and scared to see that a hypodermic needle was what poked into my foot. My friend was scared too and suggested that we pull it out and take it and me to the closest urgent care to maybe get tested for diseases that I could possibly have gotten. After waiting for a bit to be seen by a doctor, we were finally called back. I had my friend come with me in case I was told some bad news, and I didn't want to be alone. But instead of bad news, the advice I got was to wait. The most common diseases contracted through sharing needles such as HIV, AIDS, or hepatitis can't be detected for a few weeks at the very least after exposure. And even when I could be tested, he was sure that it would be negative since I didn't physically put it into one of my veins. It was possible, definitely, but less likely than, say, someone who actually shares needles for the purpose of using drugs. I felt slightly relief, but was still scared for the weeks to come. Around three weeks after the incident, I noticed that I'd get dizzy more often and had started to lose weight unexpectedly. Well, maybe not so unexpectedly since I hadn't eaten much in those few weeks, and the wound on my foot had healed fine, given that it didn't get infected and it was a small puncture wound. The symptoms that I was having made me slightly nervous, but I wrote them off as best I could as general malaise or maybe a cold. The symptoms only seemed to get worse as the weeks went by. By week 10, I finally decided that I was ready to get tested. I called my doctor's office and scheduled an appointment. If I did catch something, maybe there was something I could do about it to at least get me on the right track to feeling better. It should come as no surprise that I tested positive for hepatitis C. I was devastated, of course, but was hopeful the treatments would make me feel better. My aunt had hep C, and after many years on antiviral medications, she was fully cured of it. I was praying that it would be the same for me. I was put on a bunch of different medications that I was told would make me feel better, and I joined a support group. In my support group, I ended up meeting a lot of really amazing people, people who were going through the same thing as me. 
It helped me feel like I wasn't so alone. Of course, there were some not so amazing people there too. A lot of drug addicts have hep C and I think it's obvious why so I won't repeat myself. We were all encouraged to share our stories and when I told the group of how I contracted the virus, multiple people laughed. Like getting a life-altering disease is funny. I was bothered by it but figured if I had ignored them they wouldn't bother me. After group one day, one of the guys who laughed at me caught up to me in the parking lot. He asked me if I wanted to try the real thing since I had nothing to lose anymore anyways. He told me my health was already compromised so I could just try it for fun. I wasn't exactly sure what drug he was talking about. On the short drive home I noticed a car taking the same turns as me. I felt like I was being followed but I was also known to be a little paranoid at times so I tried not to think about it. I parked along the street in the one spot that was left and got out of my car. I made my way up the steps of my building and after realizing I forgot my keys, I had my roommate buzz me in. As I opened the door to my building, I looked to my left and saw a man walking along the sidewalk, coming in my direction. I get spooked easily so I rushed inside and shut the door quickly behind me. As I was walking up the stairs, I heard the door to the building buzz once again and saw the same man heading inside. Only, this is when I realized it was the guy from the support group who tried convincing me to do drugs with him. As I was looking down at him, he looked up the stairwell and right at me. He started sprinting up the stairs after me, and even though I was trying to run up the stairs quickly, there was no way that I could get to my apartment in time to escape him. I finally made it to my floor with very little space between us, and just as I reached the door to my apartment, I felt him slam himself up against my back and pushed me into the hardwood door. My roommate must have heard it since it didn't take her very long to open the door to see what was going on. He shoved me and my roommate inside and was quick to tell us to be quiet as he pointed his gun at us. We sat on the sofa and looked at each other with tears in our eyes. He kept asking me the same question and he kept saying it over and over again. Where is it? Just tell me where it is and I'll go and you'll never have to see me again. I kept asking him what he was talking about but he never elaborated any further. Instead, he pretty much ransacked the place looking for whatever it was. We watched as he yelled in frustration and threw different things around the room. He got in my face and yelled at me saying I was hiding it from him and he started talking to himself. I know they're hiding it from us. They must be in on it. She's one of them. She wants us to suffer. I started freaking out when I realized this guy wasn't just a dangerous drug addict. This guy was certifiably nuts. After about five minutes of him saying nothing and only staring at us, he got up and walked over to me. He grabbed me by my hair, pulled me to the small utility closet in the corner of the room where we kept most of our cleaning supplies. He shoved me inside, locked the door and told me I could only come out if I told him where the medicine was. Finally, I understood. He wanted my medication. I told him it was in the nightstand next to my bed and he could take it and leave. My roommate said that he ran into the room, got the medicine, was out of the apartment in under a minute of me telling him where to look. My roommate locked the door after he was gone and let me out of the utility closet. I called the police and we both held each other and cried while we waited for them to get there. They were at our apartment for hours collecting any evidence and taking our statements. They were able to get the man's name from the support group leader who actually knew him personally. He was arrested charged with home invasion, assault, and kidnapping for not letting us leave and threatening us with a deadly weapon. It was concluded that he was not fit to stand trial due to his diagnosed mental illnesses that were not disclosed. He was sentenced to five years in a mental institution with possible release after two years if he improved. In that time, he would receive help for his drug addiction and medical care for his hep C. It turns out that he had no insurance and felt like the only way that he could get treatment was to take someone else's meds, and unfortunately, I was the person he decided to steal them from. I don't know how he's doing now, only a year later, but I really do hope that he got the help he needed. My cousin Mary and I decided that we wanted to go camping in Yosemite in May of 2016. 
I was 25 and getting married later that summer and she was 30 and looking for an excuse to take a break from her stay-at-home mom duties that became slightly overwhelming for her. She loves her kids, don't get me wrong. Everyone just needs a break once in a while. Both of us live close to each other in Redding, California, so we made plans to drive there together and I booked one of the last open reservations at the campground we both agreed we wanted to stay at. We wanted to spend at least four days in the national park to hike and just get away from everyday normal lives. When we finally pulled into our campsite, we were honestly relieved we weren't too close to the campsites beside us. There were some trees separating our spaces which gave us some much needed privacy. We decided that we'd sleep in a tent but we also brought air mattresses so we weren't roughing it by any means. A lot of people around us were in campers or RVs but we did our best not to feel too out of place. The people camping directly to our right came over to introduce themselves. They were a family of five, a man named Ted, his wife Lois, and their three kids. The kids were on the younger side, all under ten, which meant they'd probably be loud, but both I and my cousin didn't mind. It was comforting knowing there was a family nearby and we wouldn't just be surrounded by just random dudes. I don't say that to offend anyone, it's just that we were two women camping alone. It's normal to be scared of people you don't know. We didn't get too lucky though. The two people camping in the spot to our left were men in their late thirties, already drunk at ten in the morning. When they saw Ted and his family introducing themselves, they must have taken that as an invitation to come over too. They introduced themselves as Taylor and Mateo. They were definitely not the kind of people I wanted hanging around us, so I very nicely informed them that we were going to set up our campsite and kind of hinted for them to go away. They didn't take the hint though. Instead, they took their chairs out, set them up next to where we were laying out the pieces of our tent that we were about to build, and continued drinking their beers and asking us questions about ourselves, mostly just questions about us not having our husbands with us. At one point, Mateo said, Beautiful women like yourselves shouldn't be out camping alone like this. Don't you know there are men who would take advantage of a sweet opportunity like this one? I really didn't like how he worded that saying it was a sweet opportunity. It felt like that's exactly what he was thinking. I started getting a really bad feeling about these guys, but I didn't want to ruin the trip by saying something to Mary and risk her feeling uncomfortable too. I just made a mental note of my initial impressions of these guys and told myself if they did anything else to make me uncomfortable, that I'd mention it. I was hoping it wouldn't come to that though, but of course it did. That night when we were sitting around the small fire we had built, Taylor and Mateo stumbled their way over, drunk again, only this time more handsy than they were before. Mateo sat right next to Mary and I on the blanket we were on and Taylor sat next to Mary. I think I can confidently say that we were both absolutely shocked and appalled when we felt a touch that wasn't welcomed. Mateo slung his arm around me and I almost gagged when I smelled the B.O. coming from his armpit that was now sitting on my shoulder. I looked over at Mary and saw that she wasn't having any better time than me. Taylor had his hand tightly gripping her thigh as he tried to whisper something in her ear. As if we were both thinking the same thing, we jumped up from our spot on the blanket now occupied by the two men I knew weren't good people. I hopped in the car, along with Mary and both of us, went down to the ranger's office together to report what had just happened. And believe it or not, they were amazing. They took it very seriously and offered to have the police called, but both Mary and I insisted removing them from the park would be more than enough action and enough to make Mary and I comfortable again. The rangers escorted us back to the campsite and we watched when they asked Taylor and Mateo to leave. Once they were gone, we finally started to feel comfortable again. We went to sleep that night feeling safe and excited for the days ahead of us. The next day we spent with Ted and his family since they had invited us on a hike with them and it was great. They were truly incredible people and we were sad to hear that they were leaving that afternoon to head to the Grand Canyon. Surprisingly, neither of the campsites next to us were filled that evening and by that night were still empty. We were in our tent by 11pm and Mary like usual fell asleep before me. By 1am I was still awake and I started getting this really bad feeling like something wasn't right. I laid there in total darkness, not even able to see my own hand, and heard the voices of someone outside our tent. 
I couldn't make out what they were saying, but I could tell that they were close. I flicked on the lantern to ensure that I'd be able to see what was going on around us so we wouldn't be completely vulnerable. Our tent zipped, but when you were inside you had the choice to kind of lock the zippers so it couldn't be opened from the outside. It gave me very little peace of mind though since the tent walls were literal fabric. A sharp fingernail could cut through it. I heard branches snapping and leaves crunching as they got closer. I shoved Mary, laying beside me, as my heart began to race. She woke up a lot louder than I would have liked, but the sudden force of my hand over her mouth made her shut up, and I pointed to the door of the tent and mouthed, Someone's there. They tried the zipper, and when it didn't budge, we thought they'd leave. Soon we saw the tip of a knife cut through one of the tent walls. It was slicing further down until there was a large hole in the side of our tent, it wasn't a small tent either. It was one of those tents that were tall and wide that you could easily stand up in with room to spare. What these people didn't realize was I'd brought a baseball bat with me in case something like this were to happen. Of course, I didn't expect anything like this to happen, but I was grateful that I'd taken precautions. I slowly stood up, grabbed the bat from next to the air mattress, raised it, and the second I saw the head of the person come through the hole... I swung. The sound of the bat slamming into his head was unlike any sound I'd ever heard. He was immediately on the ground, and whoever was with him was gone by the time I stepped out of the tent. Mary and I quickly recognized the man to be Mateo, and he was bleeding from the wound on his head, and we wasted no time in calling the police this time. He was taken away in an ambulance and handcuffed on the gurney. They found Taylor not far away, about to get on an ATV and leave. Thankfully, he was arrested as well. I was investigated for hitting Mateo in the head with a bat, but it was found that I had acted in self-defense. Mateo ended up completely recovering anyway, so I really didn't do anything wrong, I suppose. And both were charged for stalking and malicious intent after they discovered texts between the two detailing what they were going to do to us to get revenge for having kicked them out of the campsite. They both got less than a year in jail and two years probation, which we were happy with. Luckily, they were from another state and lived nowhere near us, so we were confident we'd never see them again. From that moment on, Mary and I decided that we'd never go camping alone again. I'm a 25-year-old female, and even now I spend most of my days working at my city's no-kill animal shelter. I originally started out as a volunteer, but after a few years, a job opened up that they offered me the position before even posting about it online or on social media. I was so happy and excited to finally get paid work for the work I've been doing for free. Now, that isn't to say that I volunteered wishing that I got paid. It was just a nice plus that I would begin to have from that moment on. Helping the animals and showing them someone cares for them was always payment enough. I like to think that I was very in tune with all the animals that came in, dogs especially. I work in Southern California, so most of the dogs that came in were pit bulls. A lot came in with aggression issues, but I never let that stop me from trying to gain their trust. It turns out a lot of people lie about the dogs they bring in to make themselves seem like less of a horrible person for abandoning a dog that obviously loved them. I understand some people have no other choice but to surrender their pet, but the amount of people that came in and surrendered their pets because they were old, smelly, or their kids got bored of them made me come really close to losing all hope in humanity. These same people usually came back when they noticed we had a puppy on our website too, but our shelter doesn't allow adoptions from people who surrender their animals. Some people may find it unfair, but it's a policy that we have to protect everything that's in our care. One day, a man brought in a very sick pit bull and before saying anything else, asked us to euthanize him. He said the dog was mean and no one would ever adopt him. Now when I tell you this dog was sick, I mean it was really sick. He basically dragged it in on a leash since it was too skinny and malnourished to even walk on its own. I looked over the counter at his sad, scared dog and all I felt was anger for the man who was bringing him in. Then even more angry when he kept insisting he be euthanized. Someone should have euthanized this guy, to be honest. 
Lord knows the world would be better off without a man who abuses a helpless creature that lives its life just wanting love. I processed the dog's intake and informed the man that we would not be euthanizing the dog and that it was no longer his decision or responsibility now that the dog was property of the shelter. The dog was rushed to our side vet as the man was leaving and I was allowed to choose his name. I decided on Morpheus. Turns out Morpheus had a lot of stuff wrong with him. He had multiple broken ribs and a broken back leg, a fractured skull, and more lacerations to his body than you could even count. He'd been through so much, but through all the exams and x-rays, he never showed any aggression. We knew that this must have been the case of animal abuse or cruelty, so we filed a report with the local police station who'd said they'd follow up with him. About two weeks after Morpheus was brought in and doing much better, we finally heard back from the police. They told us that they had gone to his house and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The guy said the dog got in a fight with his other dog and had gotten pretty roughed up. The officers also told us that he had other dogs that looked perfectly healthy, so unless we had proof that he had actually abused this dog, there wasn't much they could do other than keep an eye on him for any future complaints. I stupidly just couldn't leave it alone. I'd grown super close to Morpheus and even volunteered to foster him during his road to recovery. Although I was already 99% positive he'd become my first foster fail and I'd end up keeping him. There was something truly special about him. Anyways, back to me not giving up on finding out what happened to Morpheus. I was at work one day, thinking about what the officers said about obtaining proof to be able to charge the guy for the obvious abuse he inflicted on Morpheus, and I thought to myself how I could get the proof. I looked up the intake paperwork for that day and found his name and address and being the absolute idiot I was, decided to take a drive by his house and poke around the yard possibly to see if I could find anything, maybe even trail this guy for a few days. I will say, I'm not a small girl by any means either. I'm on the heavier side and just over six feet tall so I like to think that I could handle my own if I need to. Now the next day I didn't have to work so I took that as a sign to try to get the proof that I thought I desperately needed. The guy lived almost an hour from the shelter in a very urban area. That was something I definitely wasn't used to. I pulled in front of his house and was grateful for my very tinted windows when I saw him begin to pull out of his garage only 20 minutes later. He had a dog in his back seat, another pit bull it seemed, that did not look very healthy. I followed close enough behind him where I could see where he was going, but not too close to make myself seem suspicious. We ended up in a more industrial part of the city and I parked far away when I realized that he was stopping in front of an abandoned building. After I watched him go in, I figured that it would be smart of me to wait at least 15 minutes to follow. He's taken the dog in with him and I could hear the faint sounds of barking coming from the building. After 15 minutes, I carefully got out of my car, being cautious of any noise I heard. Now I tiptoed over to this building, peeked inside the windows, and was confused to see nothing. The barking was slightly louder, but not so loud that it would have prompted someone to call the police or anything. I'm sure no one would have cared anyways. I slowly opened the dilapidated wooden door and cringed as it creaked. I stepped forward inside and had no idea what to do next when all I saw was a completely empty building. To my right, down a small hallway, I heard the voices of two men speaking to each other. Now, I don't speak Spanish, so I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I did know that I should probably hide. They exited the hallway, and I watched as they both put wads of cash in their pockets. They exited the building, and I made my way over to the hallway. It led to a doorway that had a sign on it that said basement. The barking coming from behind the door was loud enough and I knew that it had to be what I was looking for and where the man with the dog had gone. I opened the door just a crack to see if there was anyone standing behind it and sighed in relief when there was no one there. I opened the door and stepped onto the top step of a set of stairs that went down to a more well-lit area and that's when I began hearing what I recognized as not just dogs barking, but it was dogs fighting. I got my phone out of my back pocket and began to record as I made my way down the stairs, inch by inch, trying not to make a sound. There was a section of the stairway where the wall to my right ended and a railing was the only thing that separated the stairs to the room below. I bent down and looked through the railing and 
was horrified by what I saw. Nothing could have prepared me for what I would see that day. In the small basement of that dirty abandoned building was a small dog fighting ring and a group of about 20 men all standing around as these dogs fought each other to near death as they cheered. Now the man that came into the shelter from earlier was still holding the dog from his car on a leash and I made sure to zoom in on his face to later prove to police that it was him. What I hadn't realized was all the adrenaline running through my body at that moment. I felt myself getting dizzy and I felt like I was going to throw up so I knew it was time for me to get out of there. As I was getting up from my position kneeling on the stairs, my hand slipped from the metal railing, and since it was all so sweaty, the sound of slipping off was just one big squeak. My eyes went wide, and I hopped up quickly and ran out the door at the top of the stairs. I knew they heard me. As I was running out of the building into my car, I heard multiple men yelling, Again, it was all in Spanish, so I didn't know what they were saying. As I was driving away from the building, I made a call to the police, informing them of what was happening in that building and that I had video evidence. I was then called back by a detective the next day who came to my house to talk and hear about what had happened. He began the conversation by letting me know they found no dogfighting ring, but that there was blood and hair found at the scene. I told him everything starting with the guy from the shelter bringing in Morpheus and everything I'd done after that, and that's when I showed him the video. He was just as appalled as I was. Thank God, that man was arrested later that week. Everyone was surprised that he hadn't tried to run. He was charged with animal cruelty, and after ratting out all of the other guys involved, he ended up getting no jail time and only a year probation with a condition that he never be allowed to own a dog again or live in a house with someone who does own a dog. I was happy with the outcome, and even happier no one attempted to hurt me after my testimony, like police warned me, was a possibility. Over 50 dogs were seized from several locations, and all were placed in rescues or at no-kill shelters across the state after getting proper medical care. And I wouldn't change a thing. I may have put myself in danger and it might have been stupid, but even if it saved the life of just one dog... It was worth it. I, of course, did end up adopting Morpheus. He's my best friend and the sweetest boy in the whole world. He doesn't know it, but he's the reason all those dogs were given their freedom. My boyfriend and I decided to take a road trip from our home in Sacramento down to Los Angeles to visit his family. We thought it would be nice to get out of the house and see the coastline. We knew that we wanted to take the Pacific Coast Highway. The PCH is a gorgeous drive that goes all the way up and down the California coast. It's considered one of the most beautiful drives you can make. We'd both driven it before with our families when we were younger, but never together. I was so excited. I packed like a week before we were even going to leave. My boyfriend was excited too, just not as much since he'd be doing the driving there. I was going to be driving back. Anyways, the day came to leave, and even though we said that we were going to leave early, we ended up leaving at around 2pm. It took us three hours to go from Sacramento through the awful traffic in San Jose down to Gilroy. We would cut into the coast from there. We stopped in Gilroy to try the touristy garlic ice cream and whatever else garlic stuff they had. For those who aren't aware, they grow a lot of garlic in Gilroy. They have a garlic festival every year, and when you drive through the city, if you roll down your windows, the air smells like garlic. It was a fun, quick stop, and by about 5.30, we were back on the road. After another hour on the road, we were finally on the PCH and looking out on the beautiful beaches of our gorgeous state. We were amazed, once again, by its beauty. The only problem was, this was in late fall or early winter, and the sun sets kind of early around that time. The sky started to turn dark, and it was getting harder and harder to see the ocean. I was kind of upset by this since we specifically were driving that way to see the views. My boyfriend and I ultimately decided that we'd pull off the highway into a small RV parking section along the beach and sleep there for the night. We weren't in an RV, of course, but there were very few people there and we figured it wouldn't be a problem. The evening was going by wonderfully. 
We had brought some snacks on the road with us, and both of us weren't too upset about there not being anywhere to get something to eat. We were just happy to be there with each other, and I couldn't wait to see the sun rise over the water. Our car wasn't big, though. It wasn't an SUV or something big enough to lay the back seats down and sleep. It was a Honda Civic. Still a nice car that was relatively new. We laid our seats back and covered ourselves with the blankets we'd brought with us. My boyfriend cracked the window slightly to get some fresh air in the car and we went to sleep. We were only asleep for a couple hours when my boyfriend was woken up by a tapping on the window. The glass was fogged up with condensation so it was hard for him to see out. He shook me awake and asked if I heard tapping, but I didn't. Then we heard it again. When we looked at his side window, we noticed slightly that there was a figure of a person standing outside his door. My boyfriend rubbed his window to clear it off and see who the person was. The second he did that, we knew we were screwed. Standing outside of his window were three men, dressed normally from what I could see. The one closest to my boyfriend reached into his pants and showed a gun. There technically was glass between my boyfriend and the gun, but that's not going to stop a bullet. Maybe the glass being there gave my boyfriend some peace of mind or something because somehow he was brave enough to reach for his keys and start the car. They didn't appreciate that though. They screamed at my boyfriend to get out of the car or they would kill us. And that's when the guy with the gun stuck the barrel into the small, open part of the window and pointed it right at me. I began to shake and cry and beg my husband to get us out of there, but neither of us doubted they would kill us. There really was nothing we could do but give them what they wanted. My boyfriend, in all of his terrified wisdom, unlocked the doors. Before I knew it, they opened the door and pulled him out, and that's when they started beating him. I watched in terror as they threw him to the ground and kicked him, everywhere, the stomach, the legs, the arms, even in his head. I couldn't look away. I kept screaming at them to stop, but they weren't even paying attention to me. In the middle of all of what was happening, he looked at me and, in his beaten and bloodied state, he didn't even have to say a word. I knew he was slightly telling me to run. As silently as possible, I unhooked my seatbelt and opened my door. I didn't bother shutting it since that would make too much noise and I mouthed the words I love you to him before jumping over the small partition and running on the sand along the beach. There was a small section of beach covered in large rocks. I knew if I made it over there without being noticed, I could hide and possibly make it out of there alive. Just as I was about to reach the rocks, I heard the men begin to yell that I was gone. One kept shouting, find her, you have to find her or we're screwed. I made it into the rocks and found a small section between some that would keep me hidden. Unfortunately, half of it was underwater. It was dark and I had no way of knowing what I might be joining in that small hole, but I had no other options. This was it. I slowly lowered myself in and cringed as half my body became submerged in water, and I listened as one of the men made his way to the rocks. He called out to me. He was telling me to come out and that they wouldn't hurt me, that I'd be okay and could join my boyfriend and they'd leave us alone, and there was absolutely no way that was going to happen. I heard him climb onto the rocks. He got closer and closer to where I was hiding. I started getting nervous that he was going to find me until I heard him fall. He landed far enough away from me where I couldn't see him. I held my breath and thankfully he was so focused on his injuries from the fall that he just got up and started cursing. He yelled back to the other guys that he couldn't find me. He made his way off the rocks and once I knew he was far enough away I raised myself slightly out of the hole to see what was going on. The moon was bright and I could almost see clearly where our car was parked. They all got into our car and sped away and there on the ground was my boyfriend, lying completely still. I couldn't tell if he was still breathing from where I was so I made my way out of my hiding spot and ran as fast as I could back over to him. He was still breathing but completely unconscious. Our phones were in the car they'd just stolen so I had no way of calling for help. I ran to the closest RV that was still a ways away and banged on their door. And finally, after what felt like forever, they answered. I used their cell to call the police and an ambulance was sent over. My boyfriend was rushed to the hospital on a life flight when they realized how serious his injuries were. 
He was in surgery for hours with internal bleeding, a collapsed lung, and multiple broken bones. And he was in the hospital for months. But thankfully, thank God he made a full recovery. The men who nearly killed him and stole our car were never found. They did find the frame of our car a few months later. It had been completely scrapped and obviously sold for parts. And I wish I could say there was a better outcome. That the men had been arrested and we got justice, but we didn't. Maybe someday. But for now, I'm more than okay that our reward was escaping with our lives. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I'm 25 now, but when everything went down I had just turned 17. I live in a relatively small city in Southern California called Camarillo. I guess it's not that small, but when you compare it to the cities out here it's not big by any means. It's fine I guess, it's about an hour outside of Los Angeles and a lot of people come here for the outlet malls, but when you grow up here it's just boring. Plus I never had the money to go anywhere outside of Ventura County, so I was stuck trying to find things to do close to home. I live in a single parent household growing up. My mom left when I was around three years old. My dad raised my sister and I by myself. He was a good dad, but busy. It's really expensive to live here, so he worked three jobs and wasn't home much. This also meant my sister and I got into things we shouldn't have. We both started smoking and drinking around 13 years old and my sister started dating a guy way too old for her. But my dad never knew. By the time he came home every night, he was so tired that he just collapsed in bed. He always made sure that we had a safe place to stay and that we were fed, but he never took any interest in any other aspect of our lives. I dropped out of high school when I was 16. I didn't have any friends who went to Cam High with me since they lived on the side of the city that went to Rio Mesa and Oxnard. It makes more sense if you're from the area. Going to school every day was a chore and I was just done with it. My sister and I got really close, and me being a horrible influence on her, convinced her to drop out when she turned 16 too. I regret that now, obviously. We started partying almost every night. My sister had a lot of older friends because of her boyfriend, so it wasn't hard finding somewhere to go when we wanted to get out of the house. One night, my sister's boyfriend took her and I to his buddy's house after insisting that it was just a small get-together in Oxnard. We pulled up and of course there were hundreds of people piling into this kind of small house in a not so very safe neighborhood. Now don't get me wrong, I like to have a good time. It just didn't include pressing myself against random sweaty bodies just to reach the kitchen and get drunk. I tried telling my sister that I just wanted to leave and find somewhere else to go but when she asked her boyfriend to even just take me home, he refused. He said there was a guy inside he had to do business with and told us to just wait in the car. My sister and I talked about some stupid stuff while we waited for almost an hour for him to come back. And then we heard screaming and saw him running out of the house as he shoved something down his pants. He got into the car and my sister was screaming at him, asking what just happened and all he could say was that we needed to get out of there. As he was gunning it down the street, I looked back and saw a large group of men get into a car and speed off after us. And the whole thing was chaos. I kept telling him to pull over and let my sister and I out of the car, but he wouldn't. He just kept saying that we were a part of this now and whatever happened to him at the end of the night would also happen to us. He managed to lose the people following us and I was actually a little relieved when he pulled up to another house in one of the nicer areas of the city. We all got out and as much as I wanted to just start running, I couldn't. I knew my sister wouldn't go anywhere without him and I wasn't going to leave her alone with him after what had just happened. He knocked and some really unsuspecting old woman answered the door and asked what we wanted. He said some random words and she just sighed and let us in. She called the name of whom I'm assuming was her son who came downstairs a few minutes later. He and my sister's boyfriend went into the other room and even though I was trying my best to hear what they were saying, I couldn't. Only when I looked at my sister's face, I just had this feeling she knew exactly what was going on. I stared at her for a few minutes, trying to find the words to ask her calmly what she had just gotten us both into. I knew screaming at her wouldn't work, so as nicely as possible I asked her what we were doing there. 
It took her a minute of me begging her to tell me until she finally, nonchalantly said, He sells meth, okay? Now shut up about it. Oh my god. I was furious. Not only were we probably in a meth den, we were there so her boyfriend could sell back the drugs he'd stolen from the guys at the party. That was literally his supplier's house. Apparently he owed him a ton of money and they made a deal. If he got the drugs from the party and delivered them to this guy by midnight, they'd be even. Only I guess he wasn't aware I'd be coming along. Now, I was doubly scared for my life. I was trying to be strong, but the anxiety was building up and I started to panic. All I was thinking about was my dad and how hard he worked for us, and now he was going to have two dead daughters. Finally, her boyfriend came back out and told us we were leaving. I kept begging him just to take me home, but still he refused. Instead, he took us to where he usually sells, and we sat there with him for four hours as his customers came through. A few of them even asked to buy my sister and I from him, like we were property. The worst part was it seemed like he may have even considered it. I felt gross. His car stunk of weed and cigarettes and part of me started to hate my sister for the part she played in all of this. For allowing me to be in that situation that she had to have known was entirely possible from the very beginning. Finally, around 4am, he dropped us back off at home. I ran inside and locked my door and cried for the rest of the night. It was like an epiphany. It made me regret every decision that had brought me to that night. It made me appreciate my dad a lot more than I did, and unfortunately, it also forever changed the relationship I had with my sister. She ended up moving with her boyfriend later that year, even after I tried to talk her out of it. I went back to school and graduated a year later than I had originally would have, but my dad was still proud. I still live with my dad, and both of us haven't spoken to my sister in years. Last we heard... She and her boyfriend got arrested for possession with intent to distribute almost a year ago. I can't help but feel partly responsible for the way she turned out. I try to get in touch with her, but it never works out. I hope she does change her life around. And who knows, with addiction though. I realized something recently. I survived that night. But in a way, she never did. This happened a year ago and I'm still not totally over it. I was 18 and just starting my freshman year of college in a small town in central California. It was a small local college but thankfully had an on-campus housing for the lucky few who applied for it. I was able to get a private room that didn't cost too much which made things so much easier. I preferred being in a room alone as opposed to having a roommate. I liked my privacy and I was extremely introverted back then, still kind of am. Move-in day came and my mom didn't even see me off. She was too busy with work, like she always had been throughout my whole childhood. She barely made it to my high school graduation on time. I load up my car, which I bought myself by the way, and made my way onto campus. I guess they have these move-in helpers that bring your stuff up to your room for you, but no matter how much I begged them not to, they still did. I never liked the thought of a stranger being alone with my stuff. I don't think anyone would like that. They unloaded my car and told me that they put all my things in my room while I found a place to park. I just kept stressing about whether or not these people were nosy enough to go through my personal belongings. I didn't have anything crazy that I was bringing with me or anything, but who wants a random person going through their clothes or jewelry? I finally made it up the stairs, breathing heavily and mad that the elevator was out of business, and was shocked to see someone still in my room. I saw him peeking into one of the boxes and quickly shut it when he noticed me enter the room. He then introduces himself as Derek, but told me everybody called him Skids. I already knew at that moment that I'd never be calling that guy Skids, but I humored him. I just wanted him out of my room as soon as possible, and to achieve that, it meant not asking him any more questions about himself. Unfortunately, my plan didn't work. Turns out I didn't even need to ask any questions to get this guy to tell me all about himself. I politely asked him to leave after around 30 minutes of him telling me his life story, but instead of doing the normal person thing and leaving when someone asks you to, he just pointed to something in my room and went on a long story about how it related to him and his life in some way. 
After about an hour of Derek blabbing on and on about himself, I was finally done. I may have been really shy, but he was really getting on my nerves and he had to leave my room before I actually wanted to murder him. Not for real murder him, but imagine it in my head to make myself feel better about him not understanding boundaries even in the slightest. I guess it's important to mention that Derek wasn't the most attractive guy in the world, not even close actually. He was short, maybe like 5 foot 3 and maybe weighed 110 pounds soaking wet. He told me that he was 20 which was shocking since his almost completely balding head made him look about 35. He also wore those really huge Jeffrey Dahmer style glasses which of course just added to the creep factor. His face was covered in acne too and the longer I looked the worse I felt for him. He obviously didn't have many friends and I say obviously because he literally told me that he had no friends. I realized that he had stayed in my room for so long trying to talk to me because he had nowhere else to go and no one else to talk to or listen to him. Even though I felt bad for him, I still didn't like that he wouldn't leave my room after almost begging him to. He only left once the RA noticed that he was still in my room and told him to leave. Derek said goodbye to me after trying to awkwardly hug me, which I was definitely not going to do. The RA, a really nice senior girl, came in my room and told me to sit down. I thought that she was going to tell me all the rules about staying in the dorms, but instead, she told me I should stay away from Derek. Apparently, they tried to get him banned for helping people move in because in the years before this, he ended up becoming obsessed with the girls that he helped. The school gave him a warning, and I guess if he did it again, he'd be kicked out. Three strikes rule applied. She also said that I should just straight up ignore him if I saw him again, that talking to him would only send him the wrong signals no matter what I talked to him about. She also told me his nickname, Skids, wasn't something everyone called him because it was cool. It was a nickname he picked up when he went to use the urinal, pulled his pants and underwear down completely, and the other guys in the restroom noticed that he had skid marks in his underwear. The worst part was that he completely embraced the nickname even after knowing why he was being called that. It made me feel even more weirded out that he told me he liked being called Skids instead of his actual normal person name. The next week, Derek would come by my dorm, almost shoving his way through the door to come in and talk to me. He'd stay even after I'd asked him multiple times to leave. Each time I would have to get the RA to come get him out of my room, and it got so bad that he actually ended up being banned from that floor and if he was caught coming back, he would have been banned from the whole building and forced to move. I heard from other people on campus and in the dorms that Derek was telling everyone that I was his girlfriend. The attention this creep was putting onto me was awful. People would come up to me throughout the day to ask why on earth I was dating skids and how gross they thought it was. I told everyone that he was lying and thankfully they believed me. Derek was angry that everyone found out that he was lying and he was waiting for me after class one day and the second I stepped out of the door, he was in my face. I felt his gross, slobbery lips on mine and I shoved him away as fast as possible. He shoved his glasses back up the bridge of his nose and as I was wiping my mouth, he looked around at all the people that were staring at us and said, See? I told you she was mine. She's my girl and none of you can have her. A guy I had become friends with in the class that I had just exited came up to me and asked if I was okay. Derek shoved him in the back and loudly told him that he wasn't allowed to talk to me that no guy was ever allowed to talk to me again. My friend pushed him to the ground, and it didn't take much though. I think a feather floating in the wind could have knocked him over. I walked away almost in tears and my friend came back to my dorm with me to make sure that I got there okay. I told the RA what happened and thankfully that was enough to get Derek kicked out of the dorms. It turned into a much bigger deal than what I'd planned because the school ended up giving him a notice that if he didn't leave me alone, he'd be expelled. I considered going to the police, but that would mean more attention would be on me and I didn't want that. For the three months after that, I heard nothing from Derek. He left me alone, barely looked at me actually, and I was extremely grateful for that. The friend I mentioned earlier in the story asked me out a few weeks after everything had happened and we actually had been dating just over a month when I got a letter from Derek. It said, Hi beautiful, I know you've missed me. This has been the hardest three months, four days, and nine hours I've ever been through. I know it's been just as hard for you, and I can't believe you have to date that awful guy just to make people think you don't love me. They're keeping us apart, but I promise we'll be together again. 
no matter what it takes, you're mine. I was thoroughly creeped out and my boyfriend told me I needed to show someone. I showed it to the RA who'd become my friend and she took it to the dean. Derek was then kicked out and I was able to get a temporary restraining order against him. For a while I got notes from someone telling me about the life they wanted with me and that I'd be a perfect baby maker. But because I couldn't prove who they were from, Derek was never actually caught violating the TRO. One night though, I was riding my bike home from the other end of campus when my upper body was suddenly wrapped in a blanket. I felt arms sneak around my waist and a voice whisper in my ear, Now we can finally be together. Of course, I began screaming, but there was no one around. I felt something sharp go into my stomach, and I immediately fell to the ground in pain. I managed to get the blanket off of me and I wasn't shocked at all to see Derek standing there and the dim light from the lamps overhead staring at me. He looked insane, well, more insane than usual. He had a knife in his right hand and I gasped when I noticed that there was already blood on it. And that's when I realized the psycho had stabbed me. I grabbed my side and slowly brought my hand away and saw it covered in blood. He was standing over me, laughing about how we couldn't be together in life, and we could be together in death. I watched him cut his throat and fall to the ground, bleeding profusely from his wound. He tried reaching for my hand, but I backed away. Finally, someone walking by noticed the scene and called the police. We had paramedics on campus and thankfully my wound wasn't deep and no surgery was required, but I definitely needed stitches. And believe it or not, Derek also survived. I guess he hadn't severed the major artery in his neck, so he was actually going to be fine. He was, afterwards, arrested, and I was just happy to be alive. Later on, he was charged with attempted murder, and he ended up doing 12 years in prison. Would have been less had he not had time added on for his use of the deadly weapon during the crime. And this was a long time ago. Long enough that so many things have happened in that town that barely anyone even remembers what happened to me that night. But I remember everything. I think I always will. I should mention, Derek isn't his real name. I wanted to remain as anonymous as possible and changing his name seemed like the easiest way to go about it. Apparently he got into a fight in prison in his fourth year and was subsequently killed. I don't feel anything to be honest. If anything, I'm happy that he never had the opportunity to get out and possibly want to finish what he started with me. I live in Indiana and work a very boring job that takes up more of my time than I'd like. Word to the wise, choose a profession or career path you love. Don't do something you hate just because it pays well. Misery for the rest of your life just isn't worth it. But anyways, this took place about 15 years ago when I was in my late 20s. I had about a week of vacation days lined up and I decided I'd take a fun vacation to Southern California to get my mind off the fact that I absolutely hated my life. Part of me wanted to go there and never come back, and nothing was really keeping me in Indiana. Well, I flew down to San Diego and had plans to drive up the coast to Santa Barbara over the next week. I'd rent a car and check out the many beaches and restaurants I'd seen people rave about in the blogs I'd read online. So many bloggers in those years of the internet. After I picked up the rental car, I pretty much headed straight for the beach. I didn't have a hotel booked or anything. I never really was the type to plan everything out. I thought it would be easy to find a hotel with a room. I spent that whole first day at Pacific Beach. I quickly realized it was a big tourist spot since the nearly two mile stretch of sand was packed with people. It was fine and I liked feeling the sand between my toes and watching the waves so I really had nothing to complain about. That night I went out to a Mexican restaurant and before leaving I asked around about another, possibly more secluded beach that I could go to so I could get away from the crowds. They said they really had no idea and I was about to leave feeling kind of defeated when a guy pulled up to the side and said that he knew a place where I could go. It was a little ways up the 5 freeway in a more secluded part of the coastline. He told me not many people went to that beach anymore since there had been multiple shark attacks there in the past few years. 
thankfully, none that were fatal. He told me it was once a nice beach to go to that wasn't packed with tourists and that I should give it a chance. Him mentioning shark attacks occurring there freaked me out, but he did say the last one was over a year before there and he's been there since and come out of the water perfectly fine. He even told me that he and a few of his friends were going to be going the next day and that I could tag along if I wanted to. I told him I'd love to take him up on the offer and we agreed where to meet so I could just follow him there. Not booking a hotel ahead of time was a mistake. I guess there was a convention happening that weekend and all the hotels were booked. I ended up having to stay in a nasty pay-by-the-hour place that I honestly thought was going to give me a disease of some sort, or at the very least, lice. Halfway through the night, I couldn't take it anymore and decided to check out and sleep in my car. Morning couldn't come soon enough. I drove to the gas station we decided to meet at and grabbed a coffee while I waited. They were over an hour late, but finally as I was about to leave, they showed up. The guy from the restaurant, whose name was Jose, introduced me to his friends. There was a bigger, more muscular guy named Angel and a smaller, skinnier guy named Jesus. I mostly remembered since I thought it was interesting that they were both had heavenly names. They told me to follow them as closely as possible once we pulled off the freeway since in his words, the roads get a little sketchy. It didn't sound promising. We pulled off the freeway and made our way closer to the coastline. There wasn't much out there on that stretch of land and I started getting excited when I could see the water. The road did get a little iffy the closer we got, but it wasn't anything I couldn't handle. Once we got down to the beach, Jose told me to just park right on the sand. No one else was there and he told me that he did it all the time. He pulled out a few surfboards from the back of his truck and asked if I wanted to use one, but I declined, telling him that I had no idea how to surf and wasn't really keen on learning that day. He then asked if I wanted to paddleboard instead since he had brought one along as well. I saw it sticking out of the back of his truck but thought it would be rude to ask so I was happy when he told me I could use it. They made fun of me for wearing a long sleeve swim shirt, but I didn't care. It had a cool pattern anyways, black and white stripes down the front and back with white sleeves. I dragged the paddleboard into the water and struggled to climb on top of it. I eventually did and realized trying to stand in balance was even harder. I fell off multiple times before I finally got the hang of it. I paddled out about a hundred feet from the shore. I say a hundred, but I don't really know the exact number of course. I noticed how the beach was this small cove-like beach surrounded by sharp, jagged rocks on both sides. It was really cool. I was hanging out in the water watching the waves go by and enjoying the views when I saw a shadow move directly underneath me. I, being stupid, thought it must have been a dolphin. I started yelling toward the other guys that were surfing that there were dolphins but they couldn't hear me at all. They looked my way but just pointed to their ears and shook their heads so I gave up. I sat in relatively the same spot for another hour, just soaking in the sun and sights. I saw the guys getting out of the water and packing up their stuff. I decided to paddle to the shore and see what was going on. Once I reached the edge of the water, I asked Jose why they were leaving so soon since it was only around 2pm. He said Angel's mom was taken to the hospital and they had to go. I understood, but was kind of disappointed that I wouldn't be able to use the paddleboard anymore. The disappointment didn't last long though. He told me that I could keep using the board and when I was done with it, to put it behind some bushes and he'd be back for it later that day. They left and I got back out in the water. It didn't take long for me to see that shadow again. Only this time, it was bigger. And not just bigger, but closer too. I was about a hundred feet from shore by that time and I started worrying that it wasn't a dolphin that then had its eyes on me. I thought back to what Jose had told me the day before about the shark attacks and I started to panic. I remember that you aren't supposed to make a lot of waves in the water so furiously paddling back to shore no matter how much I wanted to, it wasn't an option. Thankfully it was July so the sun wasn't going to set anytime soon. I looked around for a place that I could get out of the water that wasn't too far away. To the left and the right was just a cluster of those sharp jagged rocks that I had noticed earlier but Getting to them was my only option. I sat on the paddleboard with my arms and legs out of the water, trying to mentally prepare myself for what I'd have to do. Just as I put the paddle into the water, I felt something bump into the board. Hard. It threw me off, 
and in the blink of an eye, I was in the water. I never even saw it coming, and I panicked. I swam to the surface and was horrified when I saw the board was further away from me than the rocks even were. I knew that there was no way that I was getting that board back, so, against my earlier thoughts, I swam as hard and as fast as possible to the rocks. I cringed in pain as the sharp edges of the rock cut my arms and legs as I pulled myself into them. I tried getting as far on them as possible just to get away from the creature I'd not actually laid eyes on yet. I sat in the rocks for what seemed like a couple of hours before actually seeing it. At first, I only saw its fin, and that was scary enough. Then I saw it clamp onto the paddleboard floating close by. My heart began to race as I watched it tear its way through the board like it was nothing. I knew I had to get out of the water. There were two options. Slice up my body by wading through the rocks that led back to the beach, or enter the water with a shark and risk being sliced up by its teeth instead. I think it's obvious which one I chose. The feeling of the rock digging into my flesh was awful. It was like swimming through a pool of little knives. Every so often I would look into the deeper water and see the shark's fin breach the surface of the water. The smell of the blood coming from my cuts was probably what was keeping it around. After what felt like forever, I reached the beach. Feeling the sand under my feet was the biggest relief. When I looked up, I saw Jose back at the beach to collect his paddleboard. He saw me across the sand and asked me where the board was. When he could finally see that I wasn't in the best shape, he ran over and asked what had happened. I told him about the shark and how I had to swim through the rocks. He called the Coast Guard and reported the shark sighting and he was nice enough to drive me to the closest hospital. I had to get many stitches, but was told that I'd be back to normal in a few weeks from them. I just had to stay out of the ocean and pools for the time being. The shark wasn't spotted later that evening by the Coast Guard. They even had a chopper go up to look for it, but either way, put out a warning in the area that there was a shark sighting. They put out a warning at that beach not long after that, and I spent the rest of my trip out of the water. I still went to the different beaches, but just had no desire to get in the ocean. Even if I could have, I wouldn't have wanted to. I flew back home to Indiana and met my now wife at the airport, of all things, while I was waiting for a cab. She finds the whole thing actually pretty hilarious looking back on it, and she always wonders how I was so clueless that I'd been told about the sharks, but still thought the first shadow was a dolphin and stayed in the water with it. But I can tell you one thing, you will never catch me a hundred feet from the shore of the ocean ever again. It was November 2018. My husband came inside and told us there was a fire warning in the area and we had to be ready to evacuate immediately in case it became necessary. I wasn't that worried since it was Northern California and there were fire warnings like that practically every summer and we were always fine. We lived just outside Paradise, California. Both my husband and I had been raised in the area and had planned on raising our kids there as well. I told our oldest son, Lucas, who was 13, to pack a bag of his most important things in case we had to get out of there quickly. He understood, but commented how he wasn't concerned. The day after, we got the official voluntary evacuation notice. My husband and I looked at the fire map, and from what we could tell, it was still a ways away from us and not a real threat, so we stayed put. My husband sent the boys to my mom's about an hour away, since he said that just because we thought nothing could happen didn't mean we were totally safe. He thought our youngest children would be safer somewhere out of the way of the fire in case something were to happen. Lucas was adamant about staying with us, but not because he wanted to stay with mom and dad, but because he wanted to make sure that we all got his games and his consoles in the off chance that we would have to leave the house. We sarcastically thanked him for his concern and the day went on as usual. Every so often, I checked the fire map and grew slightly more worried as I saw it getting gradually closer to where we were. It didn't take long for the emergency mandatory evacuation notice for our neighborhood to kick in. My husband was out at work when I got the notice and I didn't want to leave without him coming home first, so I made a decision that would haunt me for the rest of my life. I decided to wait. 
I texted my husband about the mandatory evacuation notice and he told me that he thought it would be fine for me to wait for him to be home only a couple of hours from then. Seeing that he had the same idea made me feel somewhat better about it. I looked out our front window and Lucas and I watched as the rest of our neighbors drove down the road and out of sight. I started feeling like I made the wrong decision and that maybe we should have left the same time as everyone else. But I trusted my husband's intuition and Lucas and I sat on the sofa in the living room with our bags packed, ready to go when he finally got there. After an hour and no word from my husband, I looked at the fire map again, only this time it said the fire was now practically on top of our neighborhood. I got a text from my husband that said that they were letting him through to get us and that we needed to get out of there as soon as possible. I grabbed Lucas, and we slung our bags over our shoulders and rushed out the door, and it was like walking into a wall of pure smoke and ash. My lungs immediately started to burn, and my eyes felt like they were completely coated in the ash flying around us. I told Lucas to hold his breath and close his eyes. I led him to the truck and shoved him inside. I ran to the other side and hopped in as fast as I could. I started the car and ran the windshield wipers to clear the windshield of ash so I could see, so we might actually have a chance of getting out of there alive. I pulled out of the driveway and onto the road, and instead of the neighborhood I had come to love so much greeting me, I saw flames, higher than the smoke would allow me to see. Both my son and I could feel the heat. Even in the car it was almost unbearable. The paved roads seemed to be clear up ahead, and I honestly thought our only option would be to barrel through. We called my husband, and through tears I told him I didn't think we were going to make it. Lucas was sobbing, and I was trying to get him to say goodbye to his dad. I know a lot of people may say that maybe I wasn't right to tell him that we were going to die, but I really believed that we were, and I was panicking. And if we were, there was no reason to sugarcoat this anymore. That moment could have been the last time his father ever heard from us, and he needed to tell him at the very least that he loved him. Instead of saying goodbye, though, my husband told me that he loved me, but that I needed to suck it up and brave it out for our son. He told me the firefighters at the checkpoint only ten miles down the road said they didn't know if the road was completely clear, but that they should try it anyway. I kept begging him to send them in to come get us, but they couldn't. They literally weren't allowed. I told my son I loved him and slowly let on the gas. We watched the trees on either side of the road burn as the flames billowed higher. It was so hot in the truck and Lucas kept yelling and screaming at me for us to just go back and wait for his dad to come get us. I told him to shut his eyes, to get on the floor in the front of his seat. There was no reason he had to actually see what was going on around us. Besides, I knew there was no going back. I'm sure our house was already up in flames at this point, and tears were streaming down my face as I began to silently blame myself for this situation that I put my son into. We had become completely surrounded by the fire, and I was losing hope. All around me was just some apocalyptic hellscape. And I knew we weren't that far from my husband though, but the thought of getting sucked up by the fire and never coming out alive was just too terrifying, but I pushed on. Lucas had stopped screaming and started to hum. I could tell that he was still scared but trying to calm himself down. No one tells you how bright a full-blown fire is. I never knew until I was in the middle of one. Thankfully the smoke in the air seemed to dim it enough for us to not bother my eyes too much but it was so hot. I had no idea how the truck was even still running. I was waiting for it to overheat and die on us, but thankfully, thank God, it never did. The further we drove, the more the fire lessened around us. We were almost at the checkpoint when I noticed a downed tree in the middle of the road, and I tried calling my husband again, but could get no service. The fire was still raging around us, enough for getting out of the truck and walking to the checkpoint would not be an option. We had to wait it out and hope we would survive what I'd unintentionally put us through. Finally, through the smoke we saw a fire truck in the distance heading towards us. They immediately sprayed our truck with water and then did the same in the area surrounding us. They had us carefully get out of the truck and gave us masks to wear as we made our way to their truck and got inside. They drove us back to the checkpoint and we were tearfully reunited with my husband. He said that he was able to track our location through an app we all had on our phones and after showing it to the firefighters, they agreed to try to 
come to us. Turns out that we were only a few hundred feet from where the nearest unit was. We drove straight to my mom's house where our other kids were, and like the rest of the people in that community, we waited to see if we really had lost everything. And we did. Our house was destroyed in the fire and every bit of life we'd built there along with it. It's known as the campfire and ended up being the deadliest and most destructive in California history. 85 people lost their lives and a whole city was destroyed. Lives were destroyed. Every day I regret staying longer than we should have. But in the same moments of regret, I'm unbelievably grateful Lucas and I made it out of there alive. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, to wash your ass.